Here we go. My name is Alexandra and today I interview Matt Natchelton from the Center for Healing. And Matt, would you please uh, introduce yourself briefly? Yeah, sure. I'm Matt Nettleton. I'm a trauma therapist based in Melbourne, Australia. Um, with lived experience, I work with Ryan and Mel from the Center for Healing and the co-founder of Embodied Processing, um, which is a somatic approach to working with the nervous system in order to heal post-traumatic stress. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. And uh, uh, in regard to your work, uh, what are your favorite authors? Like, uh, what did inspire you and what did you take out of it for the co embodied processing course you created together with Ryan? Sure. Um, you know, so my, my experience was I was, you know, in the mental health system and it was like a mm. revolving door. Like I, I suffered from addiction um, and trauma and, you know, I had all these different diagnoses and was on something like 27 different medications and, um, no one ever mentioned trauma, you know, as being mm. the the core issue. And mm. um, I was in I was in a rehabilitation center for for addiction. Um, it was like my seventeenth attempt at mm -hmm. rehab, and uh, I started seeing a trauma therapist. And he actually introduced me to the work of Dr. Gabor Mate, who mm. um, talks about the link between trauma and adverse childhood experiences and stressful experiences in childhood and uh, addiction in in adulthood and so he became kind of you know the the message that I resonated with the most and mm. as I started to work through my own trauma I started to listen to people like Peter Levine, Bessel van der Kolk, you know, Gab Gabor Mate, Dr. Lawrence Heller. Um, so Dr. Lawrence Heller authored the book healing developmental trauma and he's the creator of NAM, so neuroaffective relational model mm -hmm. um gabo mate's uh written plenty of books uh the myth of normal um <clears throat> in the realm of hungry ghosts scattered minds hold on to your kids and a, and a bunch of others um the body says no well um peter levine his book in an unspoken voice really I found resonance with that and Waking the Tiger um, and, the, and his book, Healing Trauma. Um, Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score. Um, the, another another um, author who isn't in the realm of kind of neuroscience and trauma, but he's in the realm of kind of spiritual realization is Hamid mm. Ali. His pen name's A.H. Almas. And he authored, he's authored something like 20 different books. My favorite one's The, the Pearl Beyond Price. But I, I found a lot of inspiration from his books mm -hmm. as well. And the different inquiries, the different understandings of psychic structures, mm -hmm. um, how they're related to different kind of somatic contractions in the body and how to kind of integrate and metabolize those. So we, we took a lot of different understandings from a lot of different areas and brought them together you know there's a lot from the nam approach um in healing developmental trauma there's a lot from peter levine and somatic experiencing there's a lot of gabor's work woven in and a lot of information from all these people too but and uh, also a lot from almas um and the spiritual kind of dimension of this work but the um <clears throat> the core of it you know what came from ep isn't all these kind of things put together it's our me and ryan's own lived experience that's mm -hmm. kind of the backing of it that's what it's been birthed out of that's the presence or the energy that created ep um and our, our own lived experience and trial and error mm -hmm. um, throughout our, our own healing journey and you know taking different pieces from here and there um and putting them all together it's kind of created its own mosaic so to, so to speak yeah i experience it as a really amazing healing modality like and what it does with the clients too i mean it's like really stunning you know uh Beautiful. and without kind of working hard or something you know and it's just there's such a beautiful flow in there and it's yeah I truly love it 
Okay. And uh, your partner actually has written a little book. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really wonderful. Would you would you mind talking a little bit about it? Sure. She's actually in the middle of writing another one, oh. um, following the same kind of themes. But it's a it's a children's book, and um, you know, it's based on developing somatic awareness, body awareness for kids. So she's been through her own healing journey in regards to to trauma, and you know, it's the same process. It's very body oriented and somatic based learning to feel sensations and process sensations and emotions in the actual body versus just talking about it and I think she got to a point where she thought you know if I had been taught this like when I was a kid it would have been so preventative you know I probably wouldn't have gone through a lot of the suffering I went through or the addiction etc cetera, etc cetera. so you know we've got a two-year-old and a four-year-old nearly five uh, nearly three and five actually um and <clears throat> so she wanted to create something that would help to teach them and teach other kids how to develop that inner body awareness how to connect with their body how to reassociate with the felt sense and really inhabit their human experience and so it's a it's a basic exercise book you know of teaching kids how to feel into their belly how to hold the tension in their heart how to feel into their arms and into their legs, really basic exercise, but it's so powerful. And mm -hmm. this is the kind of stuff I'm doing with adults now who never <laughs> learned it when they were kids, yeah. you know, some like most of my clients have never been in their body. They never had inhabited their body before starting this work. You know, it's like we live in a kind of uh, yeah. up in our minds, um, thinking about reality rather than learning to feel and sense yeah. our experience. And, you know, so she she could see that gap in her own life. And so she, you know, developed this kind of practice, had it illustrated and all that sort of stuff to help kids learn how to come down and feel mm. and inhabit, inhabit their body. Yeah, so important. Yeah, and from the start, it's like, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and it's not easy to teach kids. You know, I've got a yeah. three-year-old and a five-year-old and it's like, you know, um, it's it's not easy to get them to sit down and, and do it, you know, mm -hmm. but it's like little practices and little reminders. I feel like we're planting the seeds for them to mm -hmm. be able to do it on their own. And if they've got a feeling, we'll ask, oh, so where, you know, where, how do you feel? And we've got little things, they pick up little faces and it's like, I feel sad or I feel mm -hmm. angry. Mm -hmm. Where do you feel that? You know, and just mm -hmm. little cues to help them connect with their body and um it's completely different to the way I was raised yeah. and educated you know, not just by my parents but by society and culture as a, as yeah. a whole true yeah so basically uh doing while living so yeah. during all day <clears throat> moment situations yeah and what is the title actually of the book and the name of your my little body enchantment by by tara russell tara russell yeah that yeah. i remember now thank you and um there is uh, a resistance to healing so people don't really want to touch what is suppressed you now for good reason because they <clears throat> have this overwhelm all this um um trauma being trauma informed uh then you know what's going on but if not um how can we help people to yeah not get them face their uh em emotional painful world but yeah how can we help them to be more open or more brave whatever yeah would be the right word to use there yeah yeah, yeah sure no um like i think it like comes with a lot of context setting as well and we have to be careful on our behalf of, of agenda mm -hmm. you know of, yeah. like you need to yeah no it doesn't you. Work. yeah and people feel under siege and the moment someone feels under siege they dig their nails in yeah. they feel unsafe and they resist you know yeah. um and that's that's standard of any kind of human experience not just this you know if we feel under siege we will clamp down yeah, sure batten it's down like the a, 
Yeah. Um, so, you know, context is really important. You know, mm -hmm. that's why me and Ryan spend like nearly 30 hours in ET talking about trauma, talking about how it limits our daily lives, talking about how it limits our relationships, talking about how it limits our financial situation, talking about all the ways that, you know, adverse experiences can really show up in our present life as all these things that are causing us suffering and pain and disconnect and fights in our relationships and, you know, different ways, damage that we do to our kids and, you know, really talking it like laying out a map and context so people can understand, yeah. you know, why it is they're doing this. Cause a lot of people, it's like, why would I do that? Yeah. You know, why would I face that stuff? Because they can't see the link between the consequences in their daily mm -hmm. life and this unconscious stuff that they're carrying it's kind of like, well, what's the point, you know, mm. but when you start to see that link, when you start to see, you know, mm. oh, the way I relate to my partner and my kids, that's causing kind of dysfunction in the household that relates back to this experience in my household when I was a kid, you know, when you start to connect the dots, you can, mm. in the end, it's kind of like you're left with no choice. Yeah. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> yeah. It's kind not of like, really. well, I can continue to play this out, but it's extremely painful. Yeah. You know, the more conscious we become of it, it's like, and the more we're playing it out whilst we're conscious of it, it becomes painful. It becomes very yeah. painful. And I think everyone hits that point. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm willing mm. to go there. And then, you know, on the practitioner's part, it's really about creating that safety and learning mm. to stay within someone's window of tolerance. So they're building resilience, resiliency rather than, you know, overwhelm. So, you know, a lot of people get afraid that they go into session and they're going to get completely overwhelmed. Mm. If that's happening, then, you know, the practitioner needs to learn to help someone titrate, you know, pendulate in and out mm. of something, build that resilience, like turning a tap on a little bit and then turning it off, turning it on a bit more and then turning it off and then a bit more. And so as you do that, someone develops resiliency to the pressure you know, the intensity they can, it's like, oh, I can actually feel this without going into a full meltdown. You know? mm -hmm. So and as you do that, people become less afraid of mm -hmm. their own experience. You know, they start to learn to meet more and more intensity without going beyond their threshold, their threshold, that line mm -hmm. gets further, like wider and wider of what they're able to contain within themselves. Yeah. Okay. So the more and embodiment they have step by step and I call it they have their soul connection back or also uh, yeah. have, have the soul in their body again or yeah however you want to call it and the more conscious they become again but also at the same time the less fear they have um when they started yeah. the process so it only gets better and better yeah yeah more resiliency more mm. tolerance more capacity mm. for that you know as you say the soul because you know when we've experienced trauma especially in childhood we create a split between consciousness and the body mm -hmm. you know consciousness could be said to be the soul in this terminology and mm -hmm. But rehealing that split, and as we learn to inhabit the body mm -hmm. and meet things in a safe way, in a contained way, ways that aren't just overwhelming us, you know, then it's like we learn to stay in our body, and we learn to, you know, that's we we mm -hmm. become whole. You know, we learn yeah. to meet our human experience and inhabit our human experience on that level more and more and more and more and more, which is never ending. It's not like we yeah. get to a point like I'm perfectly inhabiting my human experience 24 seven I yeah I've never met like that you know um so it's, it's an ever re deepening refinement I mean it's difficult within this world with all stuff that's happening um yeah, exactly. yeah. okay and the, this grounding coming into the body and this grounding but also Many say grounding into the earth or be grounded in the system, in the earth system. What, what is your opinion about this? Have you heard about that? 
Sure. Yeah. Gra well, grounding, you know, um, can be a great resource in order to stay in our experience. And, you know, like we talk a lot about co-regulation in um, EP where we're co-regulating with our clients. So we're in a regulated state and their nervous system is finding resonance with mm -hmm. ours. It's kind of a transmission happening and that helps their nervous system to regulate itself mm -hmm. the earth itself has a pulse which can be kind mm -hmm. of measured scientifically and it affects mm -hmm. our nervous system so we can in a sense co-regulate with earth as well and mm -hmm. our ability to stay grounded and connected to earth can really help reconnect that consciousness body mm -hmm. split you know so mm -hmm. we can start to really inhabit our system again and our body again and we talk a lot about resourcing you know things of safety earth and grounding into the earth can be a wonderful resource in order to do that to help us feel safe because it's like you know earth has this holding to it mm -hmm. like it's holding us and to be able to connect to that holding can help us develop that tolerance and make our capacity, help yeah. our capacity. i like that holding bit that's really yeah, yeah, like that. Holding, you know, if we can connect yeah. to it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, like a mother. <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. I ask you already what sources you did use to create embodied uh, processing. Um. There's so much more than yeah. I said. Yeah. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it would be impossible already. to remember them all. Okay, um, um, what is different uh, to other somatic therapies out there? And um, why do you think it's outstanding uh, in body press processing? Sure. Well, it brings in, you know, a lot of the different somatic therapies in different ways. But what, mm -hmm. you know, the part that brings it um, all together for me is the kind of spiritual aspect. It reconciles the human and mm -hmm. the spirit. You know, so it reconciles the dimensions that are available to us as human beings and the human experience. So the point of EP is to learn to inhabit our human experience and keep evolving through it. And so the difference between EP and almost every other therapy um, that I'm aware of is we're not trying to fix anything that's broken. Mm -hmm. no we're not trying to say all right you've got this disorder diagnosis problem mm -hmm. we're going to now do this to fix it you know our orientation is one of learning to meet and inhabit our human experience and grow in capacity to do that because life is life and life's going to continue to life and life will throw us curveballs and life will be difficult and we'll have pain and things terrible things happen in life there's no getting around that but what we can learn to do is meet life on life's terms and so our orientation isn't so much goal oriented in the sense we're trying to fix this but rather how intimate can i become with myself you know mm. even with the fact i've got problems how intimate can i become with those and can i have that curious explorative attitude around my humanity you know around my human experience and you know, we talk about having a kind of explorative, curious, inquiring attitude towards our experience. And when we have that, you know, then things start to unravel and life becomes a process of ceaseless discovery. You know, we're constantly discovering more about ourselves and constantly deepening our intimacy with our experience. And so, you know, what differs the main thing that differs, I think, is that fundamental orientation. It's like we're not trying to land anywhere. You know? It's mm. open-ended, so to speak. Yeah, a learning journey. So these learnings we get from it, that um, also healing journey is important. Yes, the learnings. Yeah, the learnings, you know, the insights, you know, the capacity growing, you know, mm -hmm. we're learning to to be human in, in a sense <laughs> yeah, <because laughs> grown up humans proper yeah humans. <laughs> yeah uh, um what about uh embodied processing level two you said something about that it has more a cognitive approach did i get that right um it has more of a 
you know, that more of the inquiry into mm -hmm. um, patterns. And so we created level one to help people learn to inhabit their body, you know, mm -hmm. to learn how to safely meet intensity, emotions and sensations and survival responses, et cetera. Level two is more about inquiring into our patterns, into our different responses, into the memories, into the thought structures and kind of untangling the unconscious you know, processes. It's not mm. cognitive in the sense we're okay. sitting there telling our story. Mm. It's more inclusive you know so we have a capacity to stay in the realm of sensation but the level two actually you know brings in an inclusivity of inquiring into the patterns questioning different belief systems and structures that can hold something kind of together oh thank you yeah that was interesting too mm -hmm. <clears throat> so and is embodied processing uh for everybody like uh like for therapists and starters yeah and um also it helps with really se severe trauma but it's also a bit of a tricky path yeah look like it, it i think it can be for everyone and we encourage mm -hmm. all our practitioners to do as much work mm -hmm. on themselves as they mm -hmm. can you know to me that's what makes a good practitioner is someone who's traversed the landscape of their own unconscious and then can guide someone else through it it's not someone who just knows all the theory and mm -hmm. you know it's um <clears throat> like it can benefit everyone because everyone has their human experience everyone has you know some degree of trauma of experience that still lives within them whether it's you know from their childhood or adulthood everyone has some degree of looping recycling patterns in their life everyone has some degree of stress that they're mm -hmm. kind of they find difficult to cope with um you know and it's it's i see trauma as a spectrum you know i see it's like stage five severe kind of full-blown trauma you know ptsd mm -hmm. type stuff and then there's just the everyday stress of life that can accumulate mm -hmm. in someone. It's actually the same thing, you know, um, from, a neuro, from a neuroscientific perspective of someone's nervous system being dysregulated down here versus up here. It's just more or less of that same mm -hmm. dysregulation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, can you <laughs> So, but what about the, like, narcissists, psychopaths, sociopaths? I mean, they are very uh, tough to mm. reach, I would say, yeah. And um, mm. is there anything uh, possible to do about it or rather just prevention? Well, look, like, I'm of the p perspective that those things are developments. I, I don't know about psychopathic tendencies where people have zero empathy i'm not sure i haven't read enough on it mm. to say whether people are born like that mm -hmm. um or they develop it i know narcissistic tendencies are definitely a form of developmental trauma mm -hmm. you know what they say um pathological narcissistic disorder disturbance um you know that that is a adaptation from someone's environment no one's born that way it's a development and you know as for psychopaths and sociopaths i i don't know i haven't read enough about that but my sense is it would also be a development it's an adaptation of the self you know the personality that becomes oriented in certain ways in order to survive its childhood mm. and you know, the difficult thing is you know like with a lot of people like that the defense structures to being helped can be very mm -hmm. strong you know there can be huge resistance okay. and huge denial and you know grandiose self images that kind mm -hmm. of prevent any attunement or any kind of help mm -hmm. getting through because the denial that they even need help can be so strong um but i look like I'm of the view that anything and anyone can heal, you know, mm -hmm. it's just that spark has to come from within. If, yeah. you know, someone who has that 
pathological, someone who has pathological narcissistic disturbance gets in enough pain and they say, I need to fucking look at myself mm-hmm. and I can't keep doing this. Um, I can't keep raging at my kids. I can't keep, you know, raging at my wife. I can't keep raging at my employees. Like it's, you know, I can't, I can't continue this. And, you know, if they hit that point where it's like something opens and it's okay, I'm willing to kind of look at myself because it's caused by enough suffering, you know, it's like cornered into it then something can open and they can have that kind of spark that starts to fuel their transformation. And then they can start to get curious about themselves. Creating that, you, I don't think we can create that. You know, no one can convince someone into that place. It has to happen, I would say, through suffering, you know, through being in enough pain. And like I said, the defense structures can be really strong. It can be like yeah. concrete. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, someone has to come to that place on their own. Okay. Mm. Yeah. so what about uh, artificial solutions you know mm. like uh, what they try to influence the brain for example uh, and uh, just cut it off the emotions so people um, don't uh, overreact anymore or like uh, are good citizens or whatever you know what I mean yeah 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 um Look, like I, I, I'm only aware of one thing where they do that. They inject something into people to pacify the amygdala to mm. kind of pop it off. And I don't know much about it. But for me, you know, that approach is kind of always just dealing with symptoms, mm. um, which can be helpful. I'm not saying that not to do that, but um, it's not actually resolving the issue. It's mm. shutting down symptoms, you know, a bunch of symptoms. Um, and it it's if that can help someone's life and help them to function where they're, um, oops, sorry, <laughs> um, where they're, where they're having less suffering in their lives, et cetera. Like I'm not against it. Um, you know, like medication, all that sort of stuff. It can have its place. Medication can essentially do the same thing, shut down areas of the brain um, to shut down the symptoms of someone's experience. It's like that if that helps someone at a certain point in time, that's fine. But for me, that's not transformation. Mm. That's suppression. Yeah. No, Does not really help the person. Or, yeah. yeah. Can it, can it make a better society? Not really. I don't think so. Because the problem is mm. not being dealt with, yeah. you know, it's not healing. It's mm. like I said, suppression. It, nothing's actually getting healed. It's more managing the problem, managing the disharmony. It's not, re- it's not creating harmony within no, someone. No. So, but on the other hand, we we really love harmony, kind of, yeah. Um, striving for it, but how would we be without challenges? So, in complete harmony, like in utopia or something, mm-hmm. would that make sense? Yeah, well, we'd have no resilience, you know. Um, it's like in the forest when there's drought, that's what makes the roots of the tree grow deep. Um, and in you know, like the sandstorms in the desert, that's what carves character into the rocks. Um, it's the same sort of thing with human struggles and difficulty. It it deepens us, you know. It erodes mm-hmm. away the false and what ends up left is what's true about Mm -hmm. our human experience you know it's like in tragedy that's when we all come together yeah (laughs) our hearts open to each other and deeper aspects of our humanity are opened to through the suffering and shared pain that we have and you know it's like I, i think you know harmony includes the disharmony includes the fragility and the pain. It's like one level of my body, there's cells attacking other cells and fighting each other and killing each other Mm. off from the perspective of that individual cell. It's complete discord and disharmony. But from the perspective of my entire being, it's completely needed and healthy and harmonious. Okay. So there's perspective of totality, then there's perspective as of individual. um, Mm -hmm. So we can, you know, look at it a few different ways. Um, so mm. I, I don't think there's such a thing as like utopia where it's not, 
nothing bad ever happens because <laughs> well, it's like it being always daytime, you know. We yeah, wouldn't even really get it. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Okay, so and um, I mean, when we are in too much pain and we can't uh, handle the pain, we mm -hmm. dissociate. But uh, as a therapist, we can um, ask a client to distance. Mm. And there's a big difference yeah. between dissociating and, and distancing. Can you explain that, please? Yeah, well, dissociation is a kind of automatic, unconscious mm. disconnect, mm -hmm. whereas distancing is done consciously. You know, um, so in, in dissociation, there's, you know, a sense of being out of control. So we dissociate. But when we consciously choose to distance, you know, say we, okay, let's zoom out and look at it from a distance, this sensation in the body. Mm -hmm. And let's zoom back in. And then let's zoom out. That's regaining that mm -hmm. sense of control. You know, we're regaining agency over our experience versus... Sorry, my cat's going a bit ballistic. That's good, yeah, regaining agency. Re yeah, mm -hmm. agency. It's like that sense of ownership over my experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when we're, when, we when we're traumatized, there's that loss of ownership over my experience, a feeling of helplessness, out of control, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. And so, and when we're consciously choosing to distance and step back in, we're regaining that sense of control okay. and ownership. Like I'm in control. So it's not an unconscious process like dissociation. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> um, coming back to spirituality, what are you saying about spirituality and why is it important to wake up to it? Yeah. So, you know, human consciousness is at the moment, the collective state of human consciousness mm -hmm. is contracted living in primarily mm. cognizing life um, and so the mind has a tendency to fragment our experience and divide it's based in duality division you know i versus me me versus them etc cetera, etc cetera, this part of me and we sp have split ourselves into fragments you know because the mind can't compartmentalize things <clears throat> if we're going to evolve you know, it's my perspective that we have to evolve out of the mind, you know, as, and I don't mean the mind dies or goes anywhere. I mean, it stops being our filter, you know, it, we stop filtering reality through the mind. And for me, waking up to deeper dimensions of consciousness, deeper dimensions of our spiritual nature um you know of life itself of the nature of all things of the nature of a tree the sense of the tree's being the sense of my being the sense of your being it becomes a shared mm -hmm. kind of unity and i think you know like if humans are to evolve it's going to be that evolution of consciousness and we can say that's a kind, a kind of spiritual awakening you know um in a sense we, we don't even have to use that word you know yeah. but for me, it's it's a transformation of our inner subjective reality which then mm. translates in how we act and treat each other and treat the world and mm. act in our relationships it's through transmuting and transforming our inner consciousness that then the external world changes Very and so that's why i see ep as a kind of spiritual practice yeah. as well so i um was looking <laughs> into what happens after death so what happens with us like spiritually and there are like uh, situations where people say they have a spirit attachment from somebody who died before maybe a family member whatever how do we deal with these things when we process emotions or yeah trying to become ourselves how how can we deal with this mm, yeah in, in exactly the same way as we would anything else because 
someone's mind you know it, it can have all these symbols and like everything you just said like we treat that as symbolic just like we treat any kind of memory as symbolic that's that person's subjective experience you know so mm -hmm. we can actually metabolize those emotions those you know um those thoughts those images we can inquire into them we can meet our uh, somatic experience in exactly the same way as we would anything else i i wouldn't treat that any differently you mm. know it's someone's experience so it's valid it's someone's reality mm. so it's valid it's what they're experiencing mm. can we explore it in the same way okay thank you mm. and um what about love i mean love has such a great healing potential but uh somehow it's You can hardly find it in any therapies. <laughs> in yours, it's like it's a part of the resourcing, definitely, and of the um, treating the what's coming up. So what is the power of love and why is it important and why is it, yeah, so outcast, so, mm. yeah in other more mainstream therapy yeah. it's as if everything's become sterile yeah cold empty so, yeah um, now i you know for me that's a reflection of the state of collect the collective consciousness mm. um the collective consciousness is in that pathological sterile state mm. and it's actually not conducive to healing <laughs> Mm. um you can't heal in the absence of love not true healing anyway you know um for me love is presence you know mm. attunement it's the sense of i'm fully here with you in this and you don't get you know like i've never had that going to the doctor or going to the hospital um you know and yeah. peter levine he says trauma is what happens in the absence of an empathic witness It's another way of saying trauma is what happens in the absence of love, you know. Mm. Uh, and we mm. can be going through a terribly traumatic experience, terribly difficult. If someone's there mm. present with us and says, I'm here, it's okay. And then we can move through those emotions much mm. easier. And it's that mm. sense of presence, of empathy, of love, connection, right? Mm -hmm. Being right there with someone. Mm -hmm being able to empathize with their experience you know that's the kind of healing balm of a session it's you know we can have all the techniques in the world but if we're unable to just stay right there with someone you know the techniques aren't going to really do that much it's all about that presence okay presence of, yeah so about um some uh people look at love like weakness you know and uh that you know we have to be strong we have to defend ourselves and things like that like survive blah, blah. um and we kind of have to we must be able to stand up for ourselves when something is not right um so when we are all in that love uh, um healing mode i would say um it can be a little bit unrealistic on the other hand can it or no, i suppose it depends on the situation and there's you know we can actually have very strong boundaries and our no can mm. mean no without disconnecting from love you know mm. from heartfelt empathy if we're disconnecting at the same time then that's armoring rather mm. than boundaries you know and mm. Love doesn't necessarily mean weakness. It doesn't mean I have to abandon myself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, love is much more inclusive than that. You know, love can very much say no, mm -hmm. you know, to a situation. You know, it affirms something. It aff It's affirming itself. Love would not let this happen, so no, you know. Um, and, and so, like, there can be heaps of associations of, 
love with, like you said, weakness and collapsing and fawning and pleasing and a kind of false sense of some compassion. In, in Buddhism, they have a term idiot compassion, which is um, okay. the kind of compassion where you abandon yourself. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's not real compassion. It's more people pleasing in a sense. And it looks like niceness you know it's like acting nice to keep everyone happy and avoid conflict i would say no can be very firm you know love can be very firm in that sense it's a certain quality to it where it's like when we stand in service of the truth in that moment you know, that's an act of love it just doesn't have that mushy kind of yeah. quality to it but it's still love you know yeah i think there are misunderstandings about love out there so we cleared that sure. one <laughs> okay um so with your knowledge of today what would you have done different in your life interesting question because i can i can hold the perspective that everything happened imperfect mm. it's like i wouldn't have said that at the time it was like absolute hell for you know, 15 years of my life more you know um but it's just like the sand eroding caves and character into the rock it's like i wouldn't be where i am today mm. exactly where i am um and who i am with the wisdom and the insight unless everything happened in that exact sequence it's like everything aligned itself perfectly for me to be right here saying exactly mm. what I'm saying with this exact message and the exact insights and the exact wisdom to it. Mm. And it's like, if I had a, if I could go back and tell that kid, okay, you know, if you know this, then you wouldn't have to go through that. Then this wouldn't be happening. This conversation, mm. you know, so I can, I can hold that perspective, but from another perspective, it's kind of like, well, if the, you know, addiction and mental health system was completely different, um and you know i could go back and say to that kid okay you need to look at what happened all the stuff that happened in your childhood um you know in primary school the education system all of that sort of stuff and you need to learn to be with it and you need to find this therapist you know i could have steered him away from the conventional kind of therapy that i went through that was a revolving door and actually tra re-traumatized me over and over to something that would have worked you know, um, like giving him those, that information and insight. Mm. But I don't think, I don't know if I'd do that. Not now. You know, mm. I think everything was divinely timed in a sense. So yeah. You're in peace with your past. That's yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 It's a good state of being. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, what would you want to say to your critics like yeah if you have any i i don't know but <laughs> <laughs> probably yeah because, um it's fine they can they can have their opinion i don't need to convince them out of it it's 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 perfectly fine for them to critique me you know it doesn't fit so much feel personal in a sense maybe if they were like messaging me and i had people actively attacking me i would have a different perspective but my perspective is it's fine it's like it doesn't have to cause further division um so what are your future goals and uh in regards to educating the world with your courses yeah so to bring out ep level three um you know which is where me and ryan are currently mm. outlining that um mm -hmm. and I, I would like to bring <clears throat> um the education into schools and into the corporate world as well um you know schools especially you know, i like to have teachers understand trauma to the depth that I talk about it, like I know, mm -hmm. like, you know, I have a client who's a teacher and they just did a trauma informed program. All teachers, were, it was mandatory to do it. And she's done our training and she said it was not trauma informed what they learned. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. It was just like so surface. And the lady was, you know, teaching from a dysregulated place in herself, you know, which is fine. Like she's got her own stuff going on, but the information, it was just lacking the insight and the depth. And so I would love for, 
because the implications of understanding this stuff can be really life transforming. We can mm -hmm. learn to have compassion for ourselves and compassion mm -hmm. for other people who we otherwise would just think are terrible people. You know, we can learn to separate the behavior or the personality from the person. You know, we can start to look at things more objectively and gain more insight. And so, you know, the, the message we have, uh, I would just like to see it spread in different into different kind of areas and into more mainstream areas, um, even though there's a lot of kind of resistance to that. But yeah. I, I think slowly it'll it'll get out there because more yeah. and more people are speaking about it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Hmm. It's definitely needed. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Yeah. <laughs> so is there anything else you always wanted to say? What you you know, my, my story is like a lived experience of descending into hell and coming out of it. And I actually don't know many people from my old life who got out of it. Maybe, maybe one or two, everyone else is kind of dead or spending a long time mm. in prison. Um, and so, you know, like having that trust that something will help guide you out no, I feel like something guided me out of this and took me on this journey, like a sense of grace, you know, and we all we all have that, you know, and learning to trust that inner spark, that inner spark of grace, like it's guiding you to something, you know, and can you follow mm -hmm. that? Can you learn to trust in that? Because mm -hmm. it will start to guide you out of the place you're in. Mm -hmm. If you can learn to trust on it. It's when we turn our back on it, you know, that we kind of get lost. Can you say that in one sentence, like you really like to imprint it? You're, you're held. You're held. Yeah, you're okay. held. And guided. Always and guided, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you are held and guided. You know, even in the times where it, it really feels like you're not. You know, it's like you are. It's like I look back, it's like I was the whole time. I can say that now in hindsight and see that, but yeah, it's like seeing the cells, you know, it's cord, but I can see from a more totality of perspective. Yeah, it thank was harmonious you. Well. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Matt. And yeah, if anybody wants to dive deeper, uh, there's the website for the Center for Healing dot com. And uh, there's also a directory for practitioners. And yeah, please go there, have a look. It's it's um, life-changing, totally. And thank you so much, Matt. It was great talking.